So we are here today with Amir Natu, the co-founder of OutSchool. Now, OutSchool has become a household name, but for those of you who haven't heard of it, Amir, could you please tell us a little bit more about what OutSchool offers? So OutSchool offers over 140,000 live online classes for kids. So uh, classes meet in small groups over video chats, uh, learning subjects uh, that kids have always wanted to learn and uh, teachers have always wanted to teach. For example, some of our subjects are critical thinking skills through Dungeons and Dragons, um, the science of farts, uh, learning about cat anatomy from a vet. So teachers are incredibly creative at uh, creating these interest-based classes that you couldn't, just couldn't get in school. And they really inspire kids to love learning. Um, and so that's what we offer. And um, we've served over a million learners around the world uh, at this point. And um, we're very grateful to be able to have had that impact, especially through the difficulties of the pandemic. Wow. That's a, that's a seller for kids too, not just the parents, the kind of classes that kids would want to take. Um, now, how did you come up with the idea to start out school? What was the mission, the vision behind that? Well, a lot of it was based on my own personal experience with education. I was lucky that both my parents were teachers and they didn't only help me get a great education in school, but also help me pursue my interests outside of school. Um, for example, they bought me a computer when I was age seven. They saw that I became interested to learn how to program it and found me resources outside of school to pursue that interest. And when I look back on my formal education, it was fantastic, but so many of the skills um, and learnings that I use today came from learning outside of school. And so um, when I thought uh, about having kids of my own, and I now have two, um, I wanted to build something that might help prepare them for the future and give them uh, the same kind of opportunities that I had that I when I was growing up for out-of-school learning activities. So, you know, that was a, a big part of the motivation. And then another part of the motivation was just looking at how technology had transformed how other industries were provisioning services. Uh, you know, like you can click a button on an app today and get a ride in a taxi. Uh, you can go and uh, you know, book a stay in someone else's house on Airbnb. And yet it seemed crazy that you couldn't just like, you know, get a class for your kids. You had to like book it months in advance or enroll in a particular school. And um, it seemed like there was a big opportunity to create a platform that made it easy to get out of school learning experiences in a modern way. I can see how that there was definitely a gap in the market for something like that. Makes sense. Um, now, what are some milestones along the way that have been sort of like, you know, no notable markers in the development of our school? Well, we founded the company in uh, 2015, so we've been working on it for seven years now. But, you know, our first milestone was really discovering the live online learning format. So we always knew we wanted to create this marketplace with a great variety. Uh, but we didn't know whether the best format to focus on was in-person classes, field trips, online content. And, but through our early adopter audience, we discovered that some parents and families were getting together with teachers over Skype or over Zoom. And we thought to try it out. And then we discovered that that part of our marketplace was just blowing up. We realized that this format of learning actually had these incredible characteristics of bringing the best of in-person learning in that it's interactive and teachers and kids can, can talk. But it has the best of online learning in the sense that kids can access teachers and content from anywhere. They're not just restricted to what's available in a local area. And it's really convenient. And it's a lower price point because the cost of the teacher's time can be split between the group and you don't have the cost of a physical premise. So uh, we realized that that format was going to be transformative and focused on it. So a first milestone was you know, focusing on live online learning 2017. And then you know, we found product market fit. We grew as a company. We were serving, before the pandemic, 80,000 learners and were a Series A funded company. And then, um, you know, the pandemic hit and we didn't build this company expecting there to be a global pandemic in 2020. But when the pandemic did hit, we realized that, you know, parents were just going to be desperate with schools being shut and they were going to turn to out school. And they did in very, very large numbers. And we realized that there was no other organization in North America that had uh, as much experience as we did at offering this format of classes since we've been doing it since 2017. So, um, you know, pre-pandemic we'd served 80,000 kids and now we've served uh, a million all around the world. So, um, you know, thankfully we're now, you know, in a kind of a new normal, uh, you know, I, I'm hesitant to say post-pandemic, but, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a new stable point. And uh, thankfully many, you know, in-person alternatives and schools and camps are opening up. 
and yet still so many families are you know, plugging gaps in their kids' education and what they can get locally using online resources like OutSchool. I can imagine even with hybrid learning, there's uh, plenty of uses and applications. Um, now, this is a wildly successful company, and I may be wrong, please correct me if I'm wrong, but currently it's around $3 billion, is it? Uh, so yes, the last round of funding that we raised in fall 2021, yes, did value the company at $3 billion. So I think a lot of our listeners would say that's the dream to amount success so tremendous. Now, you're talking about alternative experiences that help shape a child um, in, in development. What are some of your experiences, whether they're education, maybe working somewhere, or hobbies or interests that you think were most instrumental in leading you to this path of success? Well, you know, I've alluded to one which was very important, you know, out of school learning experience for me, which was, you know, learning how to program and having the opportunity to pursue that interest. Um, you know, another one that came from my parents was, you know, my dad was an entrepreneur and, you know, um, and uh, we always talked about business ideas around the dinner table. So I was very fortunate to have that and be in an environment from an early age uh, where I was thinking about innovation, thinking about business. Um, so my parents had a tremendous impact um, on me in, in that way. You know, another key part of my motivation was some of the you know, struggles and financial difficulties that my family had growing up. Um, so, you know, there was a point where my father's business went bankrupt. And we lost the family home. And um, my father turned back to teaching, which he had done earlier in his career. But yeah, you know, we were in tough straits. He turned back to teaching to make ends meet. And, um, you know, we were supported in, you know, shared state housing before we could get back on our, on our feet. We were essentially homeless. And um, in that time, I had previously taken classes on computers, which my parents helped me find. And at that time, the teacher agreed to, like, carry on teaching me, but for nothing. And um, that, uh, you know, that help that that teacher provided has had a dramatic impact on my life and motivates me to want to pay it back by providing both low-cost educational opportunity through OutSchool Our Business, but we also launched a non-profit arm at the start of the pandemic called OutSchool.org, where we provide financial assistance to families. We realized that you know, a challenge of the pandemic was that parents who could afford it were going to use services like OutSchool, but many wouldn't. So, you know, that was another experience that motivated me. And then on the teacher side, you know, to make sure that we're providing, you know, great earning opportunities um, for teachers, um, you know, for people like my father who maybe are struggling and need to earn a supplemental income using their skills. Um, so those are other parts of, you know, the motivation behind uh, OutSchool and kind of how we run it and our um, emphasis on access um, and diversity and opportunity on site. Wow. Thank you for sharing that personal um, story. I can see how you're clearly very passionate about it, and I'm sure that's a large contributor to the success that OutSchool has seen. Are there any partnerships that you'd say were instrumental in um, the rapid success of OutSchool? You know, it's less about partnering with kind of companies or traditional institutions. For us, it was more about partnering with communities. And in the early days, we decided to focus on secular homeschoolers as an early adopter community of this product because we knew that this was a group who were underserved by technology. They were also underserved by the existing schooling system. And um, we had a compelling offering for them in that they could use out school for both core and enrichment learning. And so we partnered with um, uh, some you know, fantastic communities such as uh, the Secular Eclectic Academic Homeschool Group, CE Homeschoolers. They're the largest um, kind of secular homeschooling group in, um, in the U.S. And, um, you know, we were very influenced by them in how the product development, so it wasn't, you know, partnership in terms of one way, like us just kind of marketing our classes through them, but also uh, they helped us, you know, craft our content policies and helped us um, figure out kind of what features to build. And so that kind of community engagement with that community was the largest, but then there were many, many other parents and learning communities uh, that we worked with was, was critical to, to our success. And you know, one thing I should clarify is I use the word secular homeschoolers. That doesn't, that's not to say homeschoolers or pa fa families and, uh, uh, of faith don't use out school. It's just we don't offer faith-based curriculum, it's secular curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's part of our content policy that our classes are secular, objective, and age-appropriate. 
um, and uh, that yeah, we use to enable to ensure kind of a quality bar uh, for these online classes. Okay, and I think that may also answer my next question, but how um, you spread awareness of the brand to the level that it's you know become basically a household name. Would, would you say it's been through the communities and word of mouth or were there any other of, uh, maybe social platforms that were particularly effective in getting the word out? Well, you know, the communities were key. And then we also found that word about the site was spreading, particularly on Facebook and other social media. And it turned out that one of the main reasons was the classes were so interesting and, and unique. Like, um, you know, I don't know of another website where you can go and buy a class on the science of farts. And, <laughs> and you know, it sounds silly, but parents love it because it's really good science. Like, kids love it because farts are hilarious, and parents love it because it's good science. And it also makes very catchy social media posts. So the teacher's creativity was driving our growth. The fact that they create these unique classes, some of them became very catchy on social media. And then we started, as we grew, um, investing in marketing that then also use this classes, which was a, a win for us as a company and a brand and a win for uh, teachers. And then so as we've grown that um, kind of virtuous cycle of, you know, we become more popular as a platform um, that drives more enrollments to teachers, more teachers come on board. They create more interesting classes, which helps us get the word out uh, about our school. That that's just become stronger and stronger. I guess that's just growing interest. And uh, yes, I would look up that, uh, Fart science, was it, on social yes. media? I can see my kids just <laughs> putting that on replay. Mom, mom, look at this. Um, now, because there's a mentorship aspect to this um, series, I'm going to ask about challenges in overcoming those. But with all the student listeners that we have, and even teachers in the education industry, I have a lot more questions about the applications and course offerings right after that. So... Um, are there any, I mean, not are there any challenges, there must have been challenges with operating a company at that scale. Um, could you share some of those um, experiences or, or one that stood out and how you overcame that challenge? I, oh, there's many challenges along the way. Um, I'll, I'll highlight two. Um, and, you know, one was maintaining quality and um, kind of cohesion of our teaching community through such fast growth. Because we now have 10,000 teachers on the platform. Um, and we wanted to create a real community where teachers didn't feel like they were competing with each other on a marketplace, but instead were collaborating in order to up-level their skills. And you know, that's relatively easy when you have 10 or 100 teachers. But how do you do it with you know, 10,000? And, and we had to scale very rapidly. We had 1,000 teachers at the start of COVID, and now we have 10,000. And um, one of the ways we did that was by, well, not doing it ourselves, you know, we started, um, you know, uh, getting help from our teacher community, hiring teachers from our teacher community to come and work on the out school side, working with us as contractors to help train other teachers, to help nurture um, that community, um, and as a result, kind of keep the quality bar high and make teachers feel like they had a resource to turn to that wasn't just the company, but were peers. Um, and that was critical, and, and we wouldn't get to where we are without that but it was really really tough at the start of the pandemic you know I remember my co-founder telling our team like we, there's no way we can deal with this many people coming on the platform at once we need to stop answering emails and instead I need each one of you to go hire five people from our community and they asked uh, okay by when and they said tomorrow oh, wow. <laughs> and they did um, and then the teachers who came on board at first thought they were being asked to volunteer. It's like, no, we're going to pay you to do this, <laughs> to do this, this work. But there was just such um, kind of uh, drive to help at that time and to be part of the community that people thought we were asking for volunteers. And no, we just looked like really scale up the team. But, you know, the, the team members who had to you know, go and in one day hire five people really, really rose, rose that challenge. Um, a, a more difficult time... Uh, within our teaching community was in 2017 when we raised prices. Um, so out school teachers set their own prices and out school takes a percentage. Um, but in 2017, we realized that we would need to raise prices on the out school side in order to be able to invest in marketing and build a company. And we changed the price from 17% to 30%, which was 
at first a huge blow for teachers. Um, and we had a lot of concern that their earnings would go down. And you know, was this OutSchool the right platform for teachers to be using, um, given that we needed to charge that price? And it was tough. And um, we didn't do the best job of um, kind of communicating the change and the why. And we learned a lot from that. But the good news is, is a few months later, teachers could immediately see the benefits because we used that extra um, money that we were getting into OutSchool to reinvest straight back into marketing. And so every teacher saw their enrollments go up. And it only needed one more enrollment per class in order to fully kind of pay for the price increase. And that really was the start of our very rapid scaling. So without that price increase, we wouldn't have been able to build like the community and the companies where it was today. So it was a hard message and change that we had to deliver for teachers that ultimately paid off both for them uh, and for out school the company. Um, so those are some of the challenges along the, along the way. That's a terrific lesson in business leadership for all our listeners. Um, and now to go to the different course offerings, I mean, I got so excited looking through your website because it's not just traditional courses, like you said, and it's not just those silly ones, the fun ones either. I saw courses on uh, neurodiversity. There's a whole section on ADHD, a section on autism. That's revolutionary in this field. You don't see that every day. Even on YouTube, if you go and look, there's not too many resources like that. Um, how did that section become so inclusive? Was that something newer or was it there from the start? It was there from the start because, you know, our early community of secular homeschoolers, many of them had opted out of the traditional system because their children had differences. Many were gifted in some way. Many were twice exceptional. Uh, that is, you know, having some gift, but also having some challenges. Um, you know, some for the parents, it was more philosophical, like they wanted their kids to have less structure and more ability to pursue interests. And what that meant was there was a lot of demand for the start for courses that would address kids' unique needs, where maybe they could take classes that are outside the typical age ranges. Like our first, very first class in out school was a um, scientist, a researcher, talking about his research into stem cells uh, targeted at 12-year-olds. And that's just like, you know, gifted 12-year-olds. It's just not a subject that you could um, get for that, for that age group. So that's been there from the start um, and, you know, continues to be, you know, a very large part of out-school classes that address unique learning needs, social and emotional learning, as well as, you know, the fun classes I alluded to and the, um, you know, more academic classes. Like, you can get regular math, you can get regular science and language arts, um, those are usually the kind of interest-based ones that pull people up, people in, and mm -hmm. then they then they go deeper in the areas that they really want to really want to double down. In. Let's talk a little bit more about those um, high-achieving youth, or gifted youth, or just generally high-working. And I heard you in the talk earlier, and I really like how you were talking about having an enriched curriculum for just about any learner, not just a gifted learner. But it does happen to be that a lot of the gifted learners are capable and in search of that kind of learning. Um, we have a lot of Mensa listeners as well um, in the youth, Gifted Youth Group of Canada. And um, what can they look forward to on um, OutSchool? Well, tremendous variety. So, um, you know, gifted kids will often have eclectic interests and want to go kind of really deep in certain areas, often deeper than is typically offered at their age range or in areas which just, you know, it's hard to find maybe someone locally who's advanced enough to, uh, to help them or has like that exact speciality. And so on our platform, they can reach teachers from around the world um, and find you know, the right learning group uh, for them and the right level um, in a way that's very, very difficult to find elsewhere. And what's more is, you know, the teachers on our platform are entrepreneurs. They're motivated to create classes that meet demand. So if there is not a class on OutSchool yet that fulfills exactly what you're looking for, uh, there's an ability to just message the teacher and request one. And they'll often create one because they know that if they create one for you, it's likely that you'll share it with your friends. And it'll likely turn out that there's other people around the world who are also going to want a similar class. So you know, that kind of variety and then flexibility to be able to get exactly what you want um, is, is what you can expect. I can just imagine the Emma former president of Mensa, Millie Nori, laughing as she hears this because it's like you know the community so well. <laughs> yes, they're going to want to request something that's not already there. That's just the nature, yes. right? 
Um, wow. Now, a lot of these children are also very um, into entrepreneurship. Are there classes on entrepreneurship for uh, younger children? Is there a certain age where that starts, or is it open to anyone? There are classes on entrepreneurship, um, including starting at middle school age. Um, and, you know, and there's classes on stock trading. And there's classes on you know, other aspects of you know, finances. And um, you know, that's another thing that I'm very passionate about, that I think the traditional education system comes to those too late. And those are subjects that, A, can be very economically valuable for someone, and B, are like really interesting. <laughs> like, um, you know, I, I think kids often you know, want to uh, you know, get, to the, uh, uh, get to the future faster and you know, grow up and be able to do all those things. Well, you know, they, can, they can have it now. There's no need to wait to start a business or learn how to start a business. Like one of our early classes in our school was me and my co-founder literally kind of teaching a course on entrepreneurship. And we would take kids around and do little tours of uh, uh, startups that we knew in, in Silicon Valley. Now, we can't do that ourselves anymore. Um, but, you know, there are now entrepreneurship classes on the platform. Who better to teach that course? Now, as a teacher of entrepreneurship yourself, of sorts, what kind of advice would you give to these aspiring entrepreneurs or even mature listeners who, are, who want to take that leap into starting a business? Well, I would say, um, you know, you can start at any time. There's really no barrier uh, to starting a business. And also, you don't need to... Um, it's not like um, black or white in the sense you don't need to like jump in as a whole. You could first start small. You could start on the side. You could start at the weekends and carve out time to work on a business. Some people feel like this is a thing that they you know, have to wait for until just the right time, whereas actually it's one of those things that's best learned experientially by trying things and, and learning and experimenting. So I'd say you know, if you want to do it, don't wait. Start now. Start small. And then iterate and learn, um, and uh, you know that's the um, that's how I got started. I think that's the that's the best way to get started. That is great advice to start manageably. And are there any future developments for OutSchool that our listeners can look forward to? Well, we recently finally launched uh, an iOS app. People have been asking for that forever. We Woo-hoo! have a website, but we didn't have an app before, and now it's easier to access uh, classes. That's like streamlined the user experience. And we're growing internationally. So we have had learners join from um, over 150 countries. But the majority have been in the U.S. and Canada because we haven't done as much um, marketing outside of the U.S. and Canada. Whereas now we're starting the process of internationalizing the site, translating it into different languages. We're seeing tremendous demand internationally for um, kids to take classes with other kids from around the world in the English language. And I believe there's tremendous social goods that could come of having kids have positive learning experiences with people from other cultures early in life. Um, so I'm very excited about that, both from a business perspective and also an impact perspective. I cannot wait. Now, before we close, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, you know, I guess, firstly, I'm grateful for you listening because, um, you know, the support of families, parents, kids, and um, communities of diverse learners have been intrinsic to outschool success. So, you know, the fact you're listening and the fact you're interested um, in education means that I feel you've been part of our success. And I hope to you know, welcome you into, into our community if you've not tried out school already. You've got to check out OutSchool. If you haven't already, take a look. Parents, students, young, older students, there's something for everyone. There really is... Um, Thank you so much for joining us today, Amir. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.